they were filming Mutiny on the Bounty with Marlon Brando. So we actually got to go out on the mutiny, on the on the bounty with, and so we got, had some wonderful experiences. And at that time, very few young people went to Tahiti because it was so expensive. Candid Conversations, and uh, today we have a very special guest, Carol Rowley, who is a former San Ramon City Council member, a teacher, and uh, the principal of uh, Country Club Elementary School. She is now retired. Welcome, Carol. Thank you, Aparna. It's wonderful to see you. It's wonderful that you could join us. How do you feel having lived in San Ramon for close to 50 years or even more than that 51 now? 51 years, very, very fortunate. I just feel like I, this is my happy place. I love San Ramon. So how does it feel coming on a show through Zoom and getting to hear a title that has no deep meaning? It's as straightforward as it is. We are recording at one o'clock and it's conversations. <laughs> It's, it's, it's amazing. Although I was thinking back to this in, uh, in 1970, my husband and my three children and I went up to Fortuna and it was Christmas time and we saw Santa Claus arrive by helicopter and he zoomed over to us and our family and they took loads of pictures. And so we, they said, it's going to be on the five o'clock news. So we drove all the way back to Fortuna and Jerry's dad had been with us, but his grandmother, Eliza Jane, who was 95, had stayed behind. So we turned on the TV, which was new for her. She had not been around a TV very long. The news came on and she saw Jerry and I and our three kids and her son on TV and she could not believe it. She looked at the TV, she looked at us sitting in the living room, and she got up and left. It was too much for her. <laughs> A very emotional day to see. Right, something. right. So I think back to that, how technology has moved forward is amazing, yeah. So thank you for sharing that, and I would also like for you to share a message. First of all, have you filled out your census yet? Definitely. That was the first thing I did. So, thank you for doing that. We love early responders. As you can see, it's very difficult. Very important. This. Very important. So to do. Could you give us a short message on why it is important to respond and those who haven't responded, what they should be doing? You should be proud to be an American and participate in the census. Every person that fills out the census, it gives out pertinent information. It's nothing that they don't know who has shared it, but they share all the content. So it means that we might get more money for childcare. We might get more money for seniors, according to where we live. It, it, it helps everybody. Don't be afraid. Please do it. Because it, it really helps with our economy and our government. They know what more uh, programs that they need to continue you know, in our area. So it's very important to fill it out. Thank you for that message. So please, everyone, listen to the words of wisdom coming from Carol Rowley, and please respond to your census questionnaire. We want to get a full count. Yes. Um, for our Thank you, Carol. So you do realize there are 24 hours in a day, and you yes. need time to sleep. Where do you find the time to do everything that you do, and how has this shelter in place impacted uh, that that whole schedule that you have of 48 hours, 72 hours, all crammed in one 24-hour day? Well, what I try to do is to keep to a schedule, you know, so I get up in the morning, you know, take a shower, get dressed, come down and have breakfast, and then I usually go for a walk and um, then go out and garden. I always have things on my list that I want to do every day. Sometimes I'll watch something on TV if it's good, but mainly I just keep busy. Right now I'm um, trying to get organized, going through projects and trying to you know, finish things up and things like that. 
it's very important. I always talk to all my friends and my relatives and keep track of everybody because um, a lot of people might be going through hard times right now and it's just, they want to hear a friendly voice and I'm there for them. So it, it affects everybody differently. So you just have to be there and help others. So you have found a way to transition in and out of this, and I'm sure you'll very easily get out and go back yeah, to your- Oh, definitely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> yes. Woohoo! For all of us. So um, let's go back to your childhood. Um, okay. Obviously, you were a child at some yes, point. Yes, I was a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> so your family, your parents, your grandparents, I mean, you had- members who were pretty active in the community yes, yes, yeah so please tell us a little bit about okay. that well I, I, I was born in albany hospital in albany california and my mother had worked for east bay mud and then she uh quit when you know when i when she found out she was pregnant my dad was an auditor for the federal reserve bank so he bought a little mcgregor house in albany and my brother and i my mom and dad lived there until my I got married and my brother got married. So it was just a wonderful, you know, family. We did a lot of gardening. That's where I get my gardening. My mom was one of five and my father was one of six. So we had lots of relatives and cousins and we were always getting together for family activities. My mom and dad were, when I started school, my dad was uh, president of the men's club. My mother was on PTA. Uh, and they always did community outreach. And so my brother and I were raised, you know, in that environment. So um, I went to all, uh, Marin School and walked a mile to school every day and loved my, my elementary teachers. And I was a Girl Scout, so I was very active in Girl Scouting um, in elementary and actually even through high school. We didn't call ourselves Girl Scouts. We called ourselves Gamma Sigma because it was a secret society uh, we just went out and helped in the community. Nobody knew that we were scouts, but we really were. I helped in hospitals. I, w I helped um, with the brownie troops. And so that's how, you know, I was raised. My brother is five years younger than I. So I was so excited when he was born. You know, I had a, I had a little brother to play with. And then um, in high school, I was really active. I was in speech. Uh, I was in all the activities. I was a homecoming queen. I went to Girl State, I was student body president, I was in drama, and I guess I found out in my early life, I like to be where the action is. I love to be around people, and I get a lot of energy from others. I just, uh, I tr and I treasure all my friends. I have friends that I've had ever since kindergarten, all the way up through college, wherever I'm involved in, you know, I always find wonderful friends. So I have a huge network of friends, which really, is is uh, is is a wonderful gift. So um, so that was my early years. So and your then, brother, um, you talked about your brother, your younger brother. Now yes. who's got into more trouble, you or him? Probably we both got into a lot of trouble. You know how siblings are. We had fun though. We'll laugh about it now. He lives in Benicia, and he's married to Phyllis, and they have two daughters, and they have three grandchildren, three grand grandsons. So we just had so much fun. We'd go fishing during the summers. My father would be gone a lot on audits for the Federal Reserve Bank. So we would help our mom, you know, with all the household duties and things. And then when my dad would come home, my mother would always put on Teresa Brewer's record and they would dance to It's So Nice to Have a Man Around the House. So those are the memories that I have. But we camped every summer for a month. And... Um, it was just glorious, just being with the family and camping and hiking, enjoying the outdoors. So really, it was it made up for all the time when my father was traveling. He traveled to Salt Lake City for a couple of weeks and Portland, Oregon, Seattle, Washington, L.A., and the head office was in San Francisco. But he was very proud of his job, and he did a great job. When he retired, they had him come back for about five years and work some more. So he really liked it. So, so a very tight knit family. So where was the favorite uh, family campground? A Yosemite. Therapy? Yosemite. Yosemite. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yosemite has changed quite a lot uh, yes. in recent years. Have you visited and seen uh, the places that you used to visit as ch as a child? Or yes. 
Uh, has that both, changed? Both my daughters have, uh, well, camp now. They both have campers. Now we had just a cloth tent, you know, so that's a, that's the way we camp. But I went camping with Linda and Nick and the boys, and I it was so much fun. So you just see it from another point of view. But you reminisce about all the places that you went. And we always camp near Camp 12 because we brought our dog along, and they had kennels. So you put, put your dog there, and as long as you have your dog on a leash, there were certain places you could go in, in the valley. But I remember watching the fire fall from Glacier and going to Camp Curry, so whenever I go back, I'd like to go back again, you know, maybe in the, maybe when we're all through with this <laughs> sheltering in place as a place on my bucket list, I'd love to go. Yeah. So growing up, um, you go to college. Yeah. Um, so we want to hear about your college uh, life a little bit, but did you still continue the tradition of camping at that time or was that put on hold? Well, what I did, I actually was a counselor in training. So during college, I would go to Girl Scout camp and I was a counselor. And um, I started uh, working at Capwell's in Oakland. So I'd work at, you know, four or five hours a week or whatever, and that helped pay for my tuition. So I went to UC Berkeley and that was the only college I applied for. So it was a good thing I got in. And um, I, my high school was Albany High, which had 500 kids in the entire school, eighth through 12th grade. So you can imagine my first day in class at Wheeler Auditorium, where there were a thousand kids. And I'm looking around and thinking, I had all A's in high school, but I'm thinking everybody else probably had A's and A pluses because they look pretty smart to me. So that was sort of an undaunting thing, you know, I thought, but um, you know, you, you would go into smaller groups and, and you would feel more, uh, you know, involved. But I still drove to school with all my, the high school friends at that went there with me. So I did that. I st I, so I, I didn't live on campus because our, our home was so close to college. So I lived at home, went to school, and then went to, worked at Capwell's either on Monday night or Saturday. And so, um, and I started sewing for them in their, um, in their um, yardage department. So I would pick out material and then sew something in my size and then they would uh, display it for a couple of months to help sell their yardage. And then I would get the, uh, that was my college wardrobe. So it was just kind of amazing. So, how it worked into um, this uh, whole scheduling of 36 hours um, in, <laughs> in 24 hours was, was already well established by the time yes. you- I think I did it in high school. I think I did. Oh, I, did. I told you I went to Girl State. That, that I think yeah. I learned- Yes, you did. And then I ran into, excuse me, girls in college that I had gone to a girl's state with. So that was, that was fun for me. So two questions. One, of course, you mentioned that you um, went to UC Berkeley and you see these smart students. What, what in your mind is a smart student? What, what is the look? Is there like they wear glasses? They look serious? What is, I want to hear what was it. Well, that... I think I'm a very fun loving person, as you know. And everybody there seems so serious. I thought, oh my gosh, you know? And so, and um, I, what I found out, this is, this is funny. I had gone to an optometrist that I really liked in high school and I never needed glasses, he said. Well, as soon as I got in this big Wheeler auditorium and I was in the back area, I couldn't even see who was presenting. So I went to the optometry school and they were so funny because they said, how did you find your way in? So once I got my glasses and put them on so I could see, I felt more connected. But I think it was just that feeling of small classes in high school and you're so, such a large, it was like an audit, huge auditorium with loads of people. So, so, anyway. the, so that means if you wear glasses, you will look serious. So I yes. should so start I wear, wearing glasses. No, five. <laughs> Oh yes, I can Is that see better. The, I can see the studio's <laughs> look. I, I I I have to switch to that. Maybe that's why. And maybe you'd like this pair. My late husband was an optometrist, so I have lots of glasses. <laughs> oh wow, those look really nice. Okay, I can see where I can go and where I can use some uh, yes. tips on looking serious yes. when I need to. So the wear other glasses. question. The other question was, um, you know, as uh, as it is the norm nowadays. Children, students, either they themselves apply or their parents make them apply to 20, 30 different colleges, not to right. mention the application fees that are going in. Mm -hmm. the future. 
what is your advice to them that you apply to just one? I know times yes. have changed, but yes. what's the advice? Well, I think that the parents need to really talk to the, the child, talk to their, 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 uh, their son or their daughter. What do you want to do? Um, you know, and, um, and, and just how are they feeling? Do they want to go to a large college? Do they want to go to a small college? Do you want to go to a community college? Because there's nothing wrong with going to a community college for two years and then you transfer to the UC Berkeley's or Stanford because, you know, they know you're a serious student by then. It's much, much easier to get in. But there's a college for everybody. My only worry is there's some parents and it's, thank goodness it's not, no, it's, it's not that many, but a lot of them, maybe they haven't felt fulfilled themselves and, and it, they really want their son or their daughter to go to Stanford because they didn't get in, or you should go into engineering because that's what I wanted, or that's what I see you doing. But they don't um, give the student the opportunity to say, mom, dad, this is what I'm interested in, because there's a college for everybody. And when you get through with college, how many people ask you, and where did you go to college? Not many. You know, they just want to know that you found an occupation that you enjoy, uh, that you're a happy and well-adjusted individual, uh, that you have a happy life. It isn't about the prestige of going to a certain school. And I think you get, the, I think then kids, if you apply to all these colleges and then you feel like you, you get a disappointing letter, you're going to think, oh my gosh, what's wrong with me? You know, so I think you have to look at the end. Uh, what do you want for your child? Because, not, and some people don't want to go to college right away. They want to work, they want to travel, they want to experience things. And that's fine because the brain does not really develop fully until you're about 25. And so I've been on interviewing panels where you'll get into graduate school if you have, you know, if you have more life experiences, maybe you traveled or you helped out or tutored in another country. There's so many opportunities to choose from. So I don't think you should put your child in a box and just say, you have to do this. You and know, then just, uh, make it a little easier on them. You can buy them glasses and nobody will know that. The house yes, exactly. Is the <laughs> so, let's get to the next phase of your life. You, okay. you finish college. Now, are you looking for work or did you start dating? What, what happened at the, after that? Well, what I did in college was I, um, I, I knew that um, I needed an outlet. So I joined a Woodminster Civic Light Opera. So I was, that was really fun. We, we practiced two nights a week and it was singing and dancing. And we, were, we did Oklahoma and South Pacific and all these old, you know, um, uh, you know theater uh, things. Anyway, that was really fun. And then I was in The Boyfriend for a year and a half while I was in college. And that was every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night. So it was kind of hard for me to date because I was busy. But I met my husband, Jerry, when uh, we both worked at Capwell. So I was a junior in college and he had graduated from Cal already. And he had been in the Navy and he wanted to go to graduate school. So he got a job at, at Capwell's. And so that's how we met. And um, so, he, he, he worked at, I worked in the men's sportswear where I met a lot of men, but anyway, <laughs> he thought he was working in my department and the, the manager came over and said, Jerry, I'm really sorry, but you work in men's furnishings. So Jerry said, well, let's, to me, let's meet for coffee. So I said, okay, so that started it. So we went together for uh, three years, engaged for one, and then he was in graduate school. And then I uh, went to, I, I graduated from uh, Cal, and then I had to go to a graduate year to get my elementary credential. So after that, I taught for a year, and then we got married in 1961. So we were married for 43 years. So did you um, help him with his wardrobe, and did you select anything for him prior? Definitely. He was always very well dressed. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, yeah, it has to be. So you get married and go on your honeymoon to a very interesting place. Please tell us how it was. And oh, my gosh. This was a, you know, I, I told you I love gardening. And so I, I would always be out there gardening all the time. And so my family would always go to the Oakland Flower Show. 
And so I told Jerry, so we have to go to the Oakland Flower Show. Well, we got a deal because we were both students. So we um, filled out the form, you know, paid our money, it was nothing. And I forgot all about it. So Jerry is at my parents' house and we're studying and I get a phone call and they say, uh, is this Carol Meyer? That was my maiden name. And I said, yes. And they said, well, we want to congratulate you. You've just won a trip for two to Tahiti. I couldn't believe it. I didn't even know what the, I didn't even know they were giving it away. I, I was just dumbfounded, just couldn't believe it. And so they said, are you a, are you a child? Because I had printed, I was teaching third grade and I did perfect manuscript writing, you know, modeling for my third grade students. So Anyway, I said, no, I said, I'm engaged and we're getting married in July. He said, oh, wonderful. So they used Jerry and I as like their poster couple going to Tahiti. But the only problem was the, we, it was from, it was, uh, it was, I can't even remember the name of the airline now, but it, they only had one plane and it started from Hawaii to Tahiti. So you had to get to Hawaii. Well, we were students. We didn't have any money, but my best friend, Nancy, um, uh, Gearing Davidson, who I'd been in Girl Scouts with when we met when we were in kindergarten, her husband was going to law school. And he said, Jerry, that when you win a trip like that, it should be from where you won the trip, like from Oakland to Tahiti or Oakland to Hawaii Tahiti, to Tahiti. So they honored. Alan was so uh, proud. He was still in school, but that was the first case he won. And we took him out for dinner when we got home from Tahiti. So we had to stay. We went on this little airplane. It was, uh, they called it a Connie. It, was, it took us like 12 hours to get to, uh, to Hawaii. And I was scared to death of heights my first time on a plane. So I had Jerry sit next to the window. I sat next to him. And this little girl was on the aisle seat. And I kept on, I had my eyes closed. And I kept on saying, have we taken off yet? <laughs> Have we taken off yet? And finally, she patted me and she said, I'll let you know when we take off. And I thought, this, if this little girl who was about eight or nine would do that, I felt calm again. And so she would go to Hawaii every summer to visit her parents. And so the plane took off finally. And all of a sudden, I saw a little bit of fire from the, from the uh, motor. And I said, oh, my gosh, are we on fire? And she said, oh, no, that's just the afterburner. And I said, okay. So... We were the last ones to get our TV dinner before we landed in Hawaii. And we stayed in this wonderful hotel. Uh, I think it was $8 for the first floor, nine for the second. And all the stewardess and pilots stayed there because it was inexpensive. So we, uh, we could afford the $9 one. So we stayed there for two nights until we took off on the, on the airplane to, uh, from Hawaii to Tahiti. But on the way there, I mentioned to Jerry, I always had him sit by the window. So we're on a second flight. I was getting a little bit more courageous. And I said, Jerry, look at the afterburner. And he goes, oh my God, it was, the plane was on fire. And so he told the nurse and it was right, the nurse, the, the, uh, the stewardess. And she was walking out with, a, with some drinks and she threw the drinks up and said, you know, some words and went into the, to the, so they had to feather the plane, the, the, it, would have, it was a four engine plane, feather it and get the, got the plane that got it out. And then they had to let the, um, the motor on the opposite side, they let that go. So then we're flying with two engines instead of four. And they had to figure out, do we go to Tahiti or do we go back to Hawaii? So they made the decision to go back to Hawaii and they had to dump, you know, gasoline and everything so it'd be lighter. But when we arrived on, in Oahu, uh, there were fire engines and everybody out there waiting for us. It was just, so that was the beginning of my honeymoon. <laughs> did, we, you, did you, I know you go to Hawaii a lot. Did the yes. fear of flying finally go away? Or if, if, is there that little thing at the back of your head like, oh. <laughs> well, I, I think I was so excited to be married and I trusted my husband. And he was always, you know, very protective. And so I thought, and he later on did get his pilot's license. So I just felt he was very, um, you know, calm and assuring. We stayed at the Hawaiian Hotel, Hawaii, the Royal Hawaiian Hotel that night, which we couldn't believe. This one got a wonderful suite. It was like two hundred dollars, you know, more than we could have afforded any time. And so, um, and the next day we took off in the very same plane. It was all scorched on the side. 
but they only had one plane. So that was when I felt like, should I have stayed back? But I really wanted to see Tahiti. So I, you know, and we had a great time. So we stayed there for three weeks and then we spent um, two weeks in Hawaii with the girlfriend's um, par parents and then came home. And you went back for your 25th anniversary as well yes. to Tahiti. Was it still um, the same room or the same pricing they offered you? No, everything was more expensive. When we went the first time, they were filming Mutiny on the Bounty with Marlon Brando. So we actually got to go out on the mutiny, on the, on the bounty. With, and so we got, had some wonderful experiences. And at that time, very few young people went to Tahiti because it was so expensive. So most of the people were probably like my age now and you know, lower, but we were, we were in our 20s. And so it was completely different. So we went back, we saw some similar, we stayed on this um, land that was owned by Ta'aroa Salmon. He would have been the king of Tahiti and Bora Bora uh, before the French came in. So the French took over the government and then the Chinese and uh, ran, ran all the stores and things. So the Tahitians ran the beer concessions. So Ta'aroa had a beer concession on his property, which was just beautiful. But we went back to that same location and Ta'aroa had passed away, but his wife Mata was there and she recognized us because Jerry was so tall. He was six foot three and I was very short. I was five foot three. So she recognized us right away. So it was really a wonderful experience for us. So then, uh, of course, you, um, after you get married, you want to settle down and yes. you start looking at different cities. And how, how did San Ramon come to be? And there was an interesting story of you buying the house you right now are in. Yes. Um, so can you tell us that? Well, my husband bought a, uh, we lived in Berkeley when we first got married, which is close. To, and my husband worked at the Rad Lab and then went to school. And then I taught in Albany, the very same school where I had gone to school as a, as a child. And um, that's where I joined Delta Kappa Gamma. My high school teachers asked me to join that. So I'm still in that uh, organ. It's an international society of women educators. And I'm still in that organization after 50 years. So anyway, uh, we, um, after Jerry bought his practice, Jerry and I had two children at that time, Linda and Kevin, and we were living in this tiny little um, townhouse in Albany. And uh, I thought that I had retired, but when Linda was born, I, you know, I, I retired. But they started a reading program in Albany and they wanted me to, um, to do, teach reading full time. And I, so I, I, I did job sharing with a friend. Uh, so she and I job shared for three years. And then we, we decided after, after Kevin arrived, this townhouse was getting smaller by the minute and it was harder, you know, two children, you know, to be teaching. So I retired again and we started looking for a house. We looked all over Hayward, Castor Valley um, for about a year and a half during this time never found anything uh, that, that really appealed to us. So we decided this, our realtor said, you know, there's a new area in Sa San Ramon and um, I think you might like it. So we looked at the, our house, the house I'm living in right now, and uh, we loved it. Oh, we couldn't believe it. It was reasonable. The houses in Hayward and Castro Valley were very expensive at that time. So, hey, so San Ramon was just like, it was a miracle. It, the, the people that lived in the house, he was in charge of Job Corps. They only lived here for about eight months and everything was new. There was a swimming pool, everything that we needed, five bedrooms. And so I was just elated. So I, we said to Monty, our real estate agent, we want to make an offer. And he said, I'll check on it. He said, Carol, you can't make an offer. There's already a contingency. I said, well, we didn't know what a contingency was. And so he said, well, you just can't make an offer. That's what it means. And, but I still had the multiple listing. And um, so I said to my husband, I said, I'm going to call Mrs. Uslin, who owned the house and ask her what a contingency is. And he said, Carol, are you sure you want to do it? Monty said, we can't do it. And I said, well, you know me, I'm just going to find out. At least I'll educate myself what a contingency is. So I called Mrs. Uslin. She was so happy. We loved the house. And she said, I said, well, what is a contingency? And she said, well, a neighbor wants to buy the house. 
but the contingency is he has to sell his house before he could buy the house. And she said, I am very lonely. My husband and my two children and my two dogs are in LA now. And I just, I love the house, but I have to be with my family. Just offer me more money and see what happens. She was a very bright woman. So we called Monty and I said, Monty, we want the house and we want to offer $500 more. And so he said, okay, see what happens. Well, the neighbor couldn't sell their house and we got this house. And so I've been living in this house for 51 years. And so that's, just, that's very impressive. I'm sure you didn't have too many things around the house that you see now. Oh and my gosh, no. Now it's like a museum. <laughs> I have my grandmother's things, my parents' things, my things, the kids' things. I have a grandchild's room with all toys and stuff. So it's been really fun for me. And that's, that's the family collection that you so take care of and enjoy. Um, yes. yes. As you settle down in San Ramon, how does the work situation look like? And you become very active in the community, um, your husband and you. Yes. How, how did the transition happen? And um, tell us a little bit about your um, career in okay. San Ramon and okay. also the incorporation committee that um, okay. was so important. Okay. Well, when Linda started kindergarten, I started volunteering in the kindergarten class one day a week. And then they needed somebody to teach art. And I loved art. So then I started going into classrooms and teaching art. And so uh, Michelle, our, our youngest, was, uh, was, a, was little. And so I would take her with me. And so that's how I started out uh, at country club. So most, and then I was, I was very involved. I was uh, a P, in, in the PTA. And then um, when I, in, uh, I was trying to think what year it was, it was uh, not 74 when they needed reading specialists again in, in San Ramon. I thought, oh my gosh, if I could do something like that. Michelle was four. Linda, Kevin was in second grade and Linda, and Linda was in fourth grade. So I applied for this in the school district and got hired, lo and behold, at Country Club. But I didn't want to accept the job until I talked to my daughter and son because I didn't want to cramp their style to have their mom at the same school where they were going to school. So they said, Mom, you're already our Girl Scout leader. You're helping out with Cub Scouts. You know, Dad's helping out. You know, it would be fine. And actually, it was just perfect. So that's how I started out. So I started teaching reading, and uh, Jerry and I became more involved in, uh, in the community. And when we started, I think the incorporation, I was trying to think what year it was, 1983. 83, thank you. Um, we just felt like San Ramon was growing so much. And we wanted to be part, we wanted San Ramon to have its own destiny. We were being pulled by the county and our taxes and things were going to the county. And we could see where eventually we'd need our own police department. So we really got involved in, in that. And then Jerry decided to run for city council. So that was really, really fun. So in 1983, we got the whole family involved in, in um, campaigning for their dad for city council. And there were 16 people running and Jerry came in number six. And so he missed it by, by one. And so the next year uh, they wanted him to run again, but he was having knee surgery and he really felt like, you know, I just wanted to be on the first council. So after that, people came asking me to run for city council. And I said, I have a full job. I am, you know, I'm, I'm a reading specialist. I have three children. They're all involved in soccer and Cub Scouts, Girl Scouts, everything. And I just, I couldn't do that, you know. So anyway, so, the, and then we were in, um, I guess it was that year before, I was PTA president of Country Club for two years when I was, a staff member, and Jerry was PTA president at Cal High for two years. So our family has been really involved. I, you know, we don't, both of us would not start out and raise our hand to say, gee, I'd really like to do that. But you get caught up in the, in the excitement and the belief that, that this would be better if you did it. And people see things in you maybe that you don't see in yourself. And you just, you just grow in every situation. So that's how we started, you know, so we right. went door to door. So, 
Go so ahead. when when with your school um, involvement and in the PTA and and PTA takes up a lot of time yeah. and it's right. as much right. as you want to do and as much as yeah. as little as you want to do. But knowing yeah. you, you probably went all out to do this. Um, even as a teacher at Country Club and then as a principal, you made sure there was diversity. I mean, there, yes. not as much as it, as it is now. Yes. How did you um, make sure the students coming from different cultural backgrounds were feeling welcome and, and being a part of the school system overall? Well, Country Club became part of the Child Development Project. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but it's a national one now that is just amazing. It doesn't concentrate on... Um, ethnicity as much as it does as the person you know what are the gifts that you have as a person so uh, country club was the most diverse school in the school district at the time and then um, we asked and got the the uh, gifted program at country club school so we had two classes of gifted children and they came from all parts of san ramon so all over and then we uh, got we had three special day classes so we got a a lot of different children that had different learning needs. And um, when, and it was just, the whole philosophy we had was that we all had to really care about each other. And the staff and I had the most wonderful staff. And um, I grew up with them. And there are a lot of the staff members that came there the first year that I started at Country Club. So you become more like a family. And you, tr you treat the kids like family and the parents like family. So you, um, it was, and I, there were many different cultures. People would arrive from Israel or from Turkey or from all over. And we had some staff that could speak their languages or help out. So it was never, you just embraced the school and the kids and, um, and we didn't have any problems, you know, that way at all. So the, the school um, overall was a place where you could really unleash your creativity and a lot of things, a, a lot of firsts happened at Country Club. Yes. Um, can you talk about some of them? I know you talked about the radio club. And oh my gosh, yes. On that. And then a gardening school, it, uh, it was yes. one of the okay. first few. So if you can let us know a few things that were the firsts that you're very proud of. Okay. I was very fortunate to be able to hire just the best teachers at Country Club. And I would, I would interview if I was looking for like a third grade teacher, I'd always interview with the third grade team so that it was not just all, you know, my decision. You'd like to look for somebody, maybe if you needed somebody more in visual arts, you might, you know, that person would, would, would shine, you know. So we tried to have a, a mixture at every grade level of talents. So I interviewed this wonderful man from New York. His name was Barry Isix, and he was very interested in technology, and he had started a radio club. And I thought, oh, that would be so exciting to have a country club. So Barry, I was able to hire Barry. He taught science for grades um, three through six at the time, and uh, he started a radio club. And we were able to get sponsors, and we, um, we he built everything, I swear, out of uh, like coffee cans, soldering things together. I don't know how he did it. He was just a miracle worker. We got a lot of equipment donated. And so we interviewed, or we had a radio club where kids would come from all over the district to find out ham radio operating and what to do in emergency. So it really was an exciting time. Well, he and I were going to a conference and um, I just, I love to write grants. So I said, Barry, I just got this um, from NASA. I think it'd be just perfect. And he's, oh, I don't know if I really want to write that. And I said, well, let's just write it together. So we wrote this. We had to answer questions. And they were looking for a school that had a radio club. And um, so we actually, we only did it that we, I wrote down all the things that we were saying. And, you know, we were, somebody else was driving us to a conference. And so on the way to the conference, we I, we finished it. I came back that night, wrote it up, submitted it, and lo and behold, we got the, uh, they had never had a, an elementary school in this category before. So we won where we could actually talk to an astronaut. So uh, we invited all the community members in, um, oh my gosh, we had Herb 
Herb Moniz was our city manager. He came. Um, Pat Boom was there. Every, all, all the city council came. And um, we ha had it in the science room. But, well, the, and the Endeavor, the, it was the shuttle Endeavor. The shuttle Endeavor had been scrubbed a couple times be because of the wet weather. And at first it was going to be during spring break. And I thought, oh, that would be awful. So it came like two weeks after spring. The shuttle was successful. So we lined the kids up by grade level. And each grade level had five questions. And that would go to like first grade. So we, everybody had an opportunity. So when first five kids in kindergarten did theirs, they'd go to the end of the line, the next five kids in kindergarten. So everybody got to ask questions of the astronaut. So we're trying to figure out with, with the radio equipment that we had, um, and we sold t-shirts to, to, to earn money for uh, equipment. It was uh, talk to the astronaut. So I still, I, I should have worn the, um, I should have worn the t-shirt today. I, I have it for you so you can see it. Anyway, we had the best time. And when we heard the squawk squawk and we thought, oh no, we're not gonna be able to talk, that all of a sudden this woman's voice came over. It was, her name was Linda Godwin, and she was the first, you know, per, a woman to be in charge of the endeavor. I just couldn't believe it. She was so strong and such a wonderful person and really listened to the kids in the kindergarten uh, staff wanted to know, well, how do you eat? Where do you go to the bathroom? I mean, uh, tell us about gravity. They, I mean, the questions were just amazing. So we were able to talk to her for maybe about, less than 10 minutes, but we felt at that point that the science room was on the same level as the Endeavor. It was just the most exciting thing. And, and, so, and, that, and that excitement would have stayed on for a while. I'm sure something like yeah. this does not go away anytime no, soon. No, we got oh newspaper coverage, everything. So I thought it can't end there. So I called NASA and I said, do you ever have astronauts visit school sites? And they said, yes. And I said, we just had the most wonderful experience. And I complimented Linda Godwin. And um, he said, oh my gosh, that would be perfect. She hasn't gone out in two years. So um, we got community members to help pay for the trip. Uh, we had to you know, fly her in. And, uh, and she actually stayed at my house at the Rowley's Bed and Breakfast. We ran out of money and we couldn't put her up in a hotel. And I thought, well, I have a big house and maybe she could just stay here. So I showed her the Rowley's bed and breakfast and she loved it. So an astronaut slept at my house for three nights. And, and what did you feed the astronaut for well, breakfast? Uh, for breakfast, I don't even remember. I just remember I, I tried to make it look good. I'm sure it was scrambled eggs and toast and juice. And then we took her to... Um, uh, oh, it, well, the restaurants aren't even around that were here then, but we, we took her to city council meetings. Uh, we had a special open house at, at uh, Country Club. In fact, we planned it so the astronaut would be here for our open house. So she actually showed slides of what it looked like from the shuttle down to Earth. So it was the most, the biggest open house we had ever had. And then we came back to my house afterwards to celebrate with the staff and everybody. And I had appetizers and stuff for people to eat. And we just had the best time. And then the next day, um, Barry and I took her back to the airport. But the initial thing, when we picked her up at the airport, Barry said to me, Carol, do you know what she looks like? And I said, no. And we didn't have a picture or anything. So we waited till they, we knew the flight that she was coming in on the Oakland airport. And um, there was a woman standing there and she looked very, um, professional. She had on sort of a blue suit. And I just walked up to her and I said, you wouldn't be Linda Godwin, would you? And she said, yes, I am. So it was just a miracle. So I introduced myself and Barry. And so that's how it all started. But it was just a wonderful experience. So I have to ask you this question. Was she wearing glasses? And were you wearing glasses? Then? No, uh, no, I was not. <laughs> I was wearing, well, I was wearing contact lenses. And I suspect that she was too. <laughs> Okay, so it proves that you do not have to wear glasses to, to be a serious person. Yes, it, it just, it just sometimes. It doesn't yeah. hurt to hold them, pretend it like does, yeah. Yes, 
or and I just some people put them here or they put them up here, right? Correct. Yes. So at some point during all this, but whatever was going on, you did go back to finish your master's. Um, yes. And yes. your children were in high school. Yes. How did you uh, manage? I mean, I don't think I should ask you that question, but how was no, it? Please. It was, well, uh, my mom had passed away in 1982. And uh, she and I were just very, very close. And I just knew that I needed to fill my, I've, I've always been a lifelong learner. And my husband and I had gone, and my, we took my dad back east. And we had taken a trip, Jerry had gone to a conference and we traveled all over on the Eastern coast. And it just gave me a time to really, you know, sort of think about other things. And um, I had been invited to uh, participate in the Leadership Academy at Cal State East Bay at the time. And I didn't think that I could do it. But I talked to Jerry and the kids about it. And I just thought it would be the most wonderful thing, a very positive experience to me, for me to do. And Jerry was a great cook. So he said he would do the cooking. And um, Linda, oh my gosh, she did the washing and everything else. She was just amazing. And Kevin took another part and Michelle took another part. So mainly the, the main characters were Jerry and Linda because they, you know, Jerry uh, really, you know, really helped out. And so it was one of the, and then I got the kids involved too um, with some of the classes that I took. And, and uh, so it, it was, um, I would go to school every Monday and Tuesday after school from like four until like I got home about 10 and then I went to two summer schools. So I got my administrative service uh, credential and I got my master's. So I actually went through uh, the graduation ceremonies, you know, at Cal State East Bay. And it's really interesting because um, my companion Kiko was on the, uh, uh, on, on several different boards. And now um, I know the president of Cal State East Bay very, very well. And so he was amazed at how I accomplished it with the with my family duties but I did <laughs>